Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is the first special episode of the podcast, and we are going to be looking at the Bellingshausen Expedition, the second Russian circumnavigation of the globe, which returned to Russia 200 years ago this year after discovering Antarctica. I'm joined for this show by Sergei Permitin in Auckland. Sergei was born in Crimea, grew up in Kamchatka, and originally trained as a marine ecologist in Soviet Ukraine. When the turmoil of the collapse of the Soviet Union ended his plans to complete his PhD and involvement in the Soviet Union's first ecotourism company, he left the country and settled a couple of years later here in New Zealand. In his new home, he developed a strong interest in documenting and preserving the history of Russians in New Zealand, from the first wave of white Russians after the revolution, down to the thriving Russian community in New Zealand today. Through a chance discovery in an article in the early 2000s, Sergei learned that in addition to discovering Antarctica, the Bellingshausen expedition also visited New Zealand, the first Russians to do so. Not only that, but the Maori artefacts the expedition collected, now stored in the Kunstkammer in St. Petersburg and Kazan University, is possibly the most significant collection in the world, the only one gathered from a single group living in a single place, and provides tremendous insight into how the Maori lived before the age of European settlement. This discovery led Sergei to spend over 10 years studying this expedition. In 2018, working with the Russian Geographical Society, Russian and New Zealand universities, he instigated the peaceful East 200 expedition for a fleet of Russian tall ships to visit New Zealand in 2020 to commemorate that first meeting. But sadly, just as the ships were departing Russia, COVID hit and New Zealand closed its borders. The visit is still planned and work is currently underway to digitise the collection and make it available for study in New Zealand. Sergei joins me today to talk about the original voyage, the discovery of Antarctica, the first Russian visit to New Zealand, and why it did not enjoy the success you might expect. Sergei, welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, and thank you for agreeing to be our first ever guest. Hello, Jack. Hello. Thank you very much. It's a big honor for me, Um, and I'm quite happy to to share this um, uh, this story, which uh, takes a part of, uh, quite significant part of my life. So, you first became interested in the Bellingshausen Expedition, in the early 2000s, and you've been studying it for a few years now. Yes, uh, it was uh, by accident. I've got um, um, a full subscription of uh, editions uh, for the last 20 years for National Geographic, the New Zealand magazine, where I found the article, absolutely marvelous article, uh, uh, written by Gerard Hinmarsh from Russia with respect. And that story took me to the libraries back in Russia to find the original uh, or copies of original um, diaries of Bellingshausen and stories about the uh, um, expedition, first scientific expedition made by Russian Navy to the up north and down to the south. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's how it take a really active influence um, about, the, uh, about the story. So if we just introduce the period we are looking at, this is the time immediately after the Napoleonic Wars. Alexander I is Tsar, Russia played a major role in defeating Napoleon and is perhaps at the high point of its imperial power and prestige. And the Tsar wants to show that Russia is not just huge armies, it is also able to compete with Britain, Germany and the other European powers in science. And so several expeditions are commissioned. That's true. That's true. That's time. Um, there was a probably 
um, a small uh, door been opened for the for Russians to to discover something in their already full discovered worlds. So practically, the um, the Pacific was uh, taken by French and then British and Spanish and Dutch um, explorers. But um, the Russia has has been probably the very last country take a part in this uh, great uh, um, exploration of of, of wall. So there, there were few white points at this time. There was a point um, not discovered the Thousand or um, Terra Incognita, Australos, uh, the place which been tried so many times by James Cook. And the uh, another road around of the um, ice ocean up north. So to get the routing from from Asia to um, Atlantic Ocean. That's where the, the this two uh, division expedition was uh, appointed to to discover it. So Tsar Alexander the first was interested in the um, in those two last white uh, unknown places in the world, in the globe. So the one division with the two boats being sent it, uh, over to up north, to the Bering. To find the northern passage. Yeah, yeah passage. And the, the another one, uh, led by Bellingshausen, was sent it to, uh, to the Thaos. Unfortunately, we, we don't have any more information, so it wasn't such successful, the northern part of this expedition rather than the Thaos, which uh, really um, dramatically changed the situation of the Russian discovery and the Russian explorer's position in the world, as it was discovered the last, the sixth continent. So, Bellingshausen was in command of the southern expedition with two ships. Lazarev, who would go on to be a famous Russian admiral, was captain of the second ship. Who else was an important member of the expedition? Um, the exp- well, uh, it was almost 200 people there, but um, to saying the most, uh, let's say, important uh, people in this expedition was definitely um, the artist uh, uh, Mikhailov, who makes all the sketches in the person who uh, put so careful and so detailed um, uh, pictures of everything what the expedition met unknown. Uh, there was the first sketches of the Antarctica, the first uh, beautiful sketches and the pictures of uh, Port Jackson in Australia, Marlboro Sounds in New Zealand, and other points, uh, which are really uh, has now a level of treasures as uh, artifacts, as uh, stories, as uh, scientific records. And another person is um, uh, Professor Simonov, uh, who's been only one uh, a scientist in this expedition. Unfortunately, two other persons been appointed for this expedition from Germany. And unfortunately, they didn't come to the port of... Uh, so they, they've been lost track of them, so the expedition couldn't find them. So they probably disappeared. <laughs> we don't know the story. They missed their chance. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Simonov uh, was only one uh, with a real science background. He's been a professor of the Kazan University in the future, in a few years after they come back to um, to Kronstadt, St. Petersburg, to Russia. He became a rector, so principal of the Kazan University after the famous professor Lobachevsky. We have to say Lobachevsky a big thanks and great, great that um, Simona was able to collect and to make absolutely double collection uh, from the visits of an expedition, artifacts. He makes double, really understand that uh, Navy uh, department or admiralty would take everything what expedition will bring, but he makes a double collection to be able to save it and to preserve it in the Kazan University for study purpose, for academical purpose. And it was absolutely great idea of Simonov and uh, uh, Lobachevsky. So those two people I would probably rank very important uh, in the future for as a result of this 
uh, expedition. So was the expedition given a specific assignment of going south to look for Terra Incognita Astralis or Antarctica? The the message uh, which been sent it, um, by Tsar, the Alexander the first, uh, it was instruction like to go further as it's possible down south to prove or the understanding of uh, Captain Cook, there's no um, available land or um, useful land for people to uh, to get down south. So it's, it's nothing their interest. There is no interest at all for the human being to try more further than he's already done. Um, so the message from the Tsar to uh, Berlinsgausen was to discover it as much as possible, to take every uh, single items or nature records, uh, to do the uh, hydrological discovery, astronomical, to check the points, to check the long tide uh, latitudes uh, of the points and the uh, um, geographical uh, objects. Uh, so it was wide, but nothing particular. So it was a purely scientific expedition? Absolutely. There was no intention to claim islands or other territory in the Pacific for Russia or anything like that? Yeah, and that's make its expedition really different. Really different. So the expedition leaves from Kronstadt, the naval base near St. Petersburg in the Baltic Sea. And what route did it follow from there? From Kronstadt, uh, Vostok, uh, Mirny and other two boats uh, left for Europe. Definitely the, the uh, Russian fleet was uh, pretty young. And to study and have a, an experience of the long way across the oceans, it was um, not common for, for Russia. They started only 1803. Uh, from the first around the world trip of uh, uh, Captain Kruzenstern. And Bellingshausen was on that expedition too. Exactly, exactly. He's been an officer, a young officer with uh, Kruzenstern frigate named uh, Niva. Mm, Niva? No, Nadezhda. He's been on Nadezhda uh, brig. So there was two, Niva and Nadezhda. They visited Great Britain. They met Professor Banks, John Banks, Whose uh, Lazarev and the Lizgazan spent quite a long uh, time discussion. The banks, in the meantime, was very open um, uh, person, and um, he, he understand that uh, the the visit is taking only uh, scientific purpose. And he shared everything with, with them. He shared the directions. The, he shared with maps and other um, advisors. He gave other very valuable advices for. Berlinsgausen and Lazarev. So, final departure port, it will be probably Portland for this expedition, going to up north and down south. It was Portland. And right after the first, last messages from the uh, Professor Bank, take these uh, four ships down to Canadian Island and from Canadian Island direct to Rio de Janeiro, to Brazil. Then the last check with the food staff and definitely alcohol, which has been very mostly promoted in, in, the, in the Russian fleet as a, first as a, as a medicine, as a medical purpose against the different diseases. It was discipline. And the provisions, I mean, the food staff was checked by the captain very, very strict. There was unbeatable preparation for, the, for this expedition. <clears throat> we know that uh, the first uh, um, dry bullion being introduced in this expedition, the first meat in the uh, metal can, uh, it was introduced in this expedition, which was um, taken by, by experience. So the expedition was prepared very well, very well. Yeah, the dry bullion was, um, was made by the, one of the... It's just was from from some village, and he he find that it's possible to degrade uh, uh, how to say it uh, de, de, uh, dehydrate 
Yeah, great, yes. And he makes this uh, dry bouillon, which to put in the hot water, you got it back um, in a few minutes and it was really convenient to use it in a, in a long trip and uh, um, a good supplement. Um, so uh, the last port to have a provision, to have a um, rum, foodstuff and other products, before they entered to the polar circle, it was Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, it was a point where the two divisions then take their roads. So one went to the Bering Stream, North and Passage, and uh, the Benedict Gauss and Lazarus take their road to down to the south, to the uh, Terra Incognita Australis. Did they head directly from Rio de Janeiro into the Antarctic Ocean, or did they go around into the Pacific first? No, they... they they, uh, the road was taken from Rio de Janeiro to St. Georgia Islands, the, those areas, direct. Some of the subpolar islands had already been discovered by James Cook and other explorers. Yes, correct. And um, But some islands hasn't been um, recorded as islands. They've been taken as um, just a land or a coast off and was uh, named by, well, by British mainly. and. Uh, uh, Bellinshausen, when he met on his routing this um, uh, those uh, those coasts, he discovered them fully. He made a mapping and leave the names, which is really uh, important. How they care, how they respect the previous discoverers. They leave the names for those islands, as it was named coast or um, cape or anything was on the map. So they they leave the same name of uh, these explorers who find them. That's that's really nice story as well. They never renamed it. If it has a name already, coast or cape or land, so they discovered, they put on the map exactly that this is, this is an island or this is a group of islands, they leave the same name. And that's amazing. That's amazing. It's never been done by Spanish or British or French. They name it, they name it uh, simply the, their, their own name. And that's... Uh, that's interesting. That's what I was found at. Yes, that is interesting. So the expedition mapped these subpolar islands, and then they carried on towards the south and became the first people to reach the Antarctic mainland. Correct. Uh, they didn't even... I would say that they have all proved that behind this significant ice, there is a um, huge part of land. Uh, they have all the proof by, because of, um, again, respect, highly respected Captain Cook, they couldn't name it. They couldn't say that it's a continent. So they collect, as they found by the dairy, they've been very carefully, even with the written reports, they said, we found the, we, we call it uh, Machirikovi or um, Machori Lyot. Amateuri uh, lot. It means uh, from Russia. It's a uh, motherland or land, huge land, continent ice. That's 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 a different. If you translate it Amateuri, you can um, translate it from Russian like a huge piece of land as well. It will be correct. So the the different of uh, and difficult of translation makes it uh, in the future. The, the the point of of discussion, the point of the arguments, but in the meantime, the Ms. Gazan, um uh, was uh, take and, and name it Matiori dot. It means a huge uh, uh, ice which could be developed only on their continent. Lazarev, been uh, quite educated in that, and with the support of um, Simonov. They found that the ice has a different structure rather than ice in the, the up north. Very interesting. In the north of, of Russia. So that ice has a um, sort of the dry condition. Okay. So it's the same as a ice from glacier. And that's make a difference. So they put in record that the ice they met, met in, at, at, the, at the age of the area which they couldn't uh, go further that has a different structure difficult chemical and physical consistency so that's took them 
to the idea that definitely behind this wall, which was um, like 20, 30 meters high, it should be a land where those part of glacier dropped to the ocean has been developed thousand thousand years. So you can understand that it should be mountains which formatting those glacier. So taking to the age and trying to attack this new continent, this new formation, they try and go around and around. And every day they try to get deeper to the south. Um, on the date of, I believe it was uh, 25th of uh, January 1820, they've been as much further than anyone else in the history before. So that date uh, nearby the land of uh, St. Marta was recorded as uh, the, the first visual contact of people to see Antarctica. They've seen the ice glacier continent, but they couldn't say that it's a continent. And we discovered it first because uh, by status, the captain cannot, uh, Russian, by Russian uh, attitude, the captain cannot announce significant discovery. He needs to send it to the Admiralty, report it, and the Admiralty, the department, naval department, or even the Tsar, should announce, yes, we open and we discovered a continent. That's a status. That's a difference between the... Um, so the captain are not allowed to say that. Captain not allowed to take the, um, uh, his name. Take the credit. Uh, the credit, yeah. So it is respect to the, to the leader or to the, at the moment, to the Tsar, to the admiralty, who sent them to do discovery, but not announce. So they collect, and so during the first part of, of the expedition, they uh, take around almost uh, all the western part of Antarctica going towards to Australia. By April 1820, Vostok and Mirny have uh, been already tied, a uh, few damages, and uh, they decide to go to Port Jackson to have a rest and it's become a very tough time in antarctica you said that russia was still quite new to this kind of long distance expedition with the first circumnavigation being just a decade or so earlier were the ships specially built and designed to cope with severe conditions and the potential hardships on these voyages especially in a polar expedition that's a good that's a good question that's a very good question because the Unfortunately, um, even with the uh, advice of Billy Gauss and Lazarev to the Admiralty, to the, to the um, Naval Division, they asked to have a, a similar ships. So Vostok was different, unfortunately, to Mirny. Mirny, e, uh, Mirny and Blagonamirny, there's two ships. One uh, was going to North Passage and uh, Mirny going to the South. They being designed by Russian uh, engineers. Uh, Vostok was a little bit bigger, and it wasn't prepared. It was faster. It was pretty faster than 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 uh, Mirny, but uh, wasn't prepared for the uh, such tough uh, ocean. So it means that the design was different, and unfortunately, the the Vostok was pretty weak for this travel. Did they get trapped in the ice at all? Yes, um, it was prepared by, um, they used their metal uh, sheets all around the, <clears throat> the wooden part of where on the water, li- water line. Yeah, the, um, Mirny was uh, slightly smaller. The Vostok was um, around of 1,000 ton, and uh, Mirny was 880, something like that. But it was significantly bigger than uh, Endeavour or um, the, the other ships of um, twice bigger than uh, Captain Cook. They've, they've been much better prepared <laughs> for, the, for the stuff, for the stuff Antarctica. Much better prepared. It was Mirny rather than Vostok. And Vostok was much faster. So Mirny has to, to, to try. And um, 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 so Billingshausen 
try to well to well a little bit to break it <laughs> rather than than uh, Lazarev trying to to catch the flagship. Uh, it was there was another uh, another uh, tough situation, but the history never before the Vostok and Mirny before this trip around of Antarctica never get the any records of two ships or more stand together for the whole period of two years. They never lost each other. They've been in contact, they've been in touch, they've been connected. Even those ships been different, with different speed and different constructions. Yes. That's as well. It shows the professionalism of Lazarev and Denis Gausen. They have been very good captain. That's particularly impressive in the southern oceans, where the stormy waters could easily have driven them apart. Absolutely, and a tough period as well, tough, tough time. Lazarev visited uh, uh, Port Jackson a few years before. Billings Gausen visited uh, Port Jackson uh, today in Sydney first time. So for young Captain Lazarev, it was a second visit. So was it while they were travelling north from Antarctica that they were caught in the storm and blown off course to New Zealand? Or did they reach Australia first? Uh, first, it was Australia, yes. Australia, it was on the plane. And it was in the previous um, plan of expedition. They had to uh, stay and uh, to do the renovation, repairing their, their sloops and um, take provision as well. To, it was quite good period. It was almost a month they spent at Port Jackson. And then they, their road was direct to Polynesia without visiting. So that was original plan. There's no uh, New Zealand was on the plan to visit. So in a very early May, two slips, Mustaka Mirne left Port Jackson towards to Polynesia. But they found very tough, very tough, significantly tough Desmond. And it wasn't a surprise, of course. It just, the testament uh, specifically uh, May is really, really sharp. <laughs> so they fight several weeks, two weeks. They they trying to get through the to the uh, to pass the Cape Ringa and go through that to to Polynesia. But um, yeah, unfortunately, they couldn't. There was a break of one of the much at uh, on on Vostok, and uh, uh, Billingshausen signed the. Uh, Make a, a message. By the way, the the, the the first light telegraph was used by this expedition. First time uh, when the two ships communicated, so they used the light, the lamps. So the Russian discovered it and discovered the language. This was before Morse code. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. So they they designed the Russian design Russian sailors uh, marines designed this language so they could understand it. On the distance, and especially in the in the bad weather, um, to what what to do. So they they make a plan B. If anything happened, they have several plans A, B, C, D. If something happened, and they even follow this plan, it's it's amazing, amazing communication, amazing discipline, and in, in this expedition that was showing by Benedict Galvin and Lazar, amazing by code uh, that he's uh, going to the ship cove to the to the one of the favorite place of uh, Captain Cook. Um, so they've been pushed by strong northern wind uh, to the uh, Cook Strait. Uh, Cook Strait is the strait between North Island and South Island, New Zealand. Exactly. It's uh, between South and uh, North Island. Um, the, they've seen in a, is the, the weather become calm. They've seen the Mount Edmonton um, uh, Simonov make a correct measurement of uh, Edmonton, which is um, almost the same as as up to date the, the measurement. It was absolutely different on different maps, um, and so there was a first correct uh, record of the uh, heights of, of the Mount Mount Edmonton Vostok because it was it is faster encouraged into the uh, Queen Charlotte, into Taranoia first, May 27. Later night, already it was night, Lazarev and Mirny uh, put anchor just next to them 
So it was 27 of May 1820 when the Vostok and Mirny arrived to Tatranoi. The first Russians in New Zealand. First Russian in New Zealand uh, make the anchorage, yeah. Um, early in the morning, 28, they've seen their first uh, two canoes with, uh, with the Maoris. And it was the first Dutch contact between Maori and Russian, 28th of May, 1820. So this was quite a significant contact that they had with the Maori. Please tell us a bit more about that. I would say that it's, um, in a history, it's one of the uh, best examples how the Europeans or new arrivals or new people to the wild lands with the um, with the people with, diff- with different culture completely, specifically, and especially with the Maori, quite a uh, dramatic story we know from the past. Uh, every single visit of uh, Dutch, uh, British, French, it was starting from the, uh, unfortunately, from the, uh, from muskets, from killing people. That was the start. Probably the word for, for Russian, it was a, a good story, and they had more experience records, and uh, they started from immediately from trade. They had some words and phrases for communicating with the Maori available from James Cook's records, didn't they? They had some words and phrases for communicating with the Maori available from James Cook's records, didn't they? Exactly, exactly, and it was uh, very successful. The most important to understand that uh, the Russian fleet by the time has a they are called. Nobody rather than captain and officer could communicate with the new people, with the wild people, how they call it. So the 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 code of representing starting from the peaceful signs, never starting from the showing power and showing the weapons and showing the um, comes from the side of um, I'm stronger than you, be careful. So they come, we come with a, with a smile to make you happy. That's a different how they rush it. Even to use the dictionary, um, uh, pre-dictionary um, advice and support from, from different captains and uh, diaries and learn those diaries from French, from uh, British explorers, the Russians use their own way how to communicate. It's very interesting that the Russian expedition had this code and instructions to treat all the indigenous peoples they met peacefully and with respect, not only because it was unusual for Europeans generally at that time, but also compared to Russian exploration east across Siberia and into Alaska. Yes, uh, Russians use the advice and um, uh, directions uh, from the previous visits of uh, the Paranoia. And uh, they do understand and they remember and they know that Maori quite um, um, interested, um, um, well, people. And uh, the, the effect of uh, cannibalism was recorded and they've been scared a little bit as well. But uh, discipline and uh, attitude of Bellingshausen how he met the and respect the Maori who uh, comes uh, definitely uh, at this moment, if we, we're talking about the date of 28th of May, 1820, when the two canoes approached to the Vostok and Mirny, um, Russian being ready for that. We should probably note for our non-Kiwi listeners that at this point in 1820, Britain had not yet claimed New Zealand, so settlers had not arrived in the South Island although it was visited by explorers and whalers working in the Southern Ocean. Yes, and uh, we know that uh, um, New Zealand was treated uh, like, simply like resort, uh, with, uh, with really rich with whalings and uh, uh, seals and, and etc. So that was <clears throat> uh, approach of, of those two beautiful boats, beautiful boats, um, with uh, nice uniform people uh, arriving there with a strong discipline. Um, the, the Maori was definitely shaking. The, the, the um, you know, Rangatira, who represent and start talking on, on, the, on the canoe, um, respectfully being invited uh, on the board. 
he was shaking, he was scared. But uh, the first movement of Berlinsgausen make him more relaxed. He make a gift, he present him a nice uh, toki, a beautiful instrument, and um, he becomes happy. He becomes that um, uh, absolutely sure that these people, they're smiling, they come to trade. And that was a key word for them, Ika, fish. So they come to the on board and he, he screamed to the, to the people on, on the canoe that these white people come to trade fish. And they emotionally, he becomes smiling, relaxed, and he understands there's nothing happened. They're not come to kill or to take the land or to push them out. They want to trade. And that was the key. And Simonov gathered quite a collection. Some say the most significant collection of Maori artifacts here. Because while Cook gathered items around New Zealand, he didn't note or distinguish between the different tribes, while Simonov's collection creates a picture of exactly how this particular group of Maori were living at the time of minimal European contact. Yes, um, same back, the uh, uh, Russian expedition starts the trade those uh, artifacts, those samples, which have been absolutely unknown, was rare in, in, in Europe. So Simonov decided to make a double collection. All samples, all garments, all weapons, all samples of uh, curving, everything was done double. And he's carefully uh, put it uh, and stored it at, uh, at those both ships, um, very carefully to uh, assemble it and separate it during their uh, free time on ocean. Uh, going further a little bit, because of his good relationship with the famous Professor Labachevsky, who uh, arrived earlier before the Vostok and Mirny arrived back to, to Russia in 1820, he asked Tsar and Admiralty to have a permission to take the second part, the similar copy part of the, of the main collection, to Kazan. So because of respect of Lob Lob Lobachevsky, uh, as he was a rector of a Kazan University, the uh, significant part was divided. And that's why we have now, we are able to have complete collection which carefully uh, preserved in the Kazan University. Let's make um, the, uh, the Russian um, uh, artifacts collect Maori collection is so unique that um, uh, we know that those items been collected from a particular point in a particular one time. So the condition of those artifacts is significant even now. Even go through the few wars, uh, the uh, the archives save it uh, very careful, and uh, not probably everything is uh, saved. Something has been lost, uh, specifically in the Kunst camera collection, but uh, the main part is is available for the world, and it's amazing. I was interested to read that Simonov was particularly interested in how the Maori made different items and collected partly made cloaks weaving instead of finished items so that you can see how the different parts are made and put together yeah technology exactly technology from the point of the we take the the pew 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 so those uh, garments so it's made right from uh, from flakes original then it's partly unskinned and then it's partly coloring and that so it's, it can show the all the process of technology how it's made it's amazing same as uh, with the weapons, same as the weapons, uh, take the stick first and then how it goes to Ayaha, so to the end of the story. Yeah? So. so once they had installed the new mast, finished repairing the ships and left New Zealand, were there any more significant events on their way back to Russia? Uh, yes, definitely. The, uh, amazing visit and uh, uh, Tahiti, uh, meeting with the king of Tahiti. Then it was discovered... Uh, Russian islands, which unfortunately changed the name in the history. And uh, there's, um, there's just a few islands um, still under the, the Russian names. So the uh, uh, Russian society islands, how they call it, or we call it uh, Russian islands, 
uh, been discovered at atolls and, and islands. Um, first time they've been put it and uh, described on the maps. Uh, they came back to after they spent their, their summer, t- uh, their winter time in Polynesia. Uh, they came back to Sydney, uh, to Port Jackson, and they went to finish their circle around of Antarctica. So they come and they attacked uh, the, the, the ice continent again and again, and they discovered two big pieces of land, a huge islands uh, which connected by the continental ice with Antarctica. It's uh, the island of Peter the Great, and Alexander the First. Those two big islands, uh, it's significant uh, discovery. Huge islands uh, with uh, big mountains. So uh, they finished circle exactly by the same coordinates at the same point where they start. They finished it, they went to Rio de Janeiro. And uh, by the early August of 1821, they returned to Kronstadt. Once they had arrived back in Russia, what was their reception and what impression did their discoveries make? Yes, unfortunately, uh, we have to link that um, <clears throat> their return in uh, 1820 with the history of Russian Empire. Um, just to remind that uh, 1825, Alexander I was left his, uh, his throne and um, historically it was uh, one of significant events in St. Petersburg, uh, December um, 1825, where there was a revolution or the trial, and it was um, really um, a dramatic story about that. The Decemberist Revolt. The few officers from commanders uh, from this uh, expedition been arrested. Uh, one of them, Konstantin Tronson, captain, uh, one of the islands named by this captain, Amazing personally, uh, he's been a decabrist, ascended to Siberia. Um, unfortunately, that event uh, postponed it and devaluated the significant expedition result. And unfortunately, the, the, the diaries hasn't been published. Expedition Atlas hasn't been published. It was postponed. And I found that there's... Uh, not without uh, some attaching of a British uh, embassy in St. Petersburg. So there was a, some, I can't find the direct roads, but it's, it sounds like uh, somebody really was against the publishing of those story about uh, the discovery of a continent. So it stays in the shadow and uh, out of the science world. and. Um, it stayed in the secret, let's say. Only 10 years after, in 1831, the Tsar promoted this expedition with the Atlas. So there was a published information about that, uh, but it wasn't widely published. It wasn't even sent it over to Germany, to the university, like in, in Hamburg, in, in Paris. It was kept like a local knowledge, local records, nothing more. It seems like Bellingshausen and Lazarev still had quite significant careers after the expedition, though. So did their personal reputation survive intact? I wouldn't say that, because uh, position to be um, um, uh, commander of uh, Kronstadt, it is not a position so high, because... uh, Saying the Kronstadt is uh, very close to the capital, to the St. Petersburg, it was like um, Waiheke Island for, uh, for, for Auckland and uh, without possibility. So it was um, Lazarus being sent it over to the Black Sea, far from, from capital. So the careers wouldn't go celebration. Of course, the reputation was highly. Uh, Lazarus made significant career in the, on the Black Sea from Nikolaev to build a Sevastopol. And we know that we have to appreciate his, um, his engineering for the uh, Black Sea Russian fleet. But anywhere, it was far from real respect from Tsar, from, from we call it palaces and, and the people, unfortunately. 
So it was more like they kept their military position, but they did not have any great social position. Yes, yes true. It's, it, um, it's interesting because names of our captain and their leaders in, in this time, you find them mainly German, um, some French, uh, mixed with Russian, but not as much. They're more very it, it, it significant part of it was uh, uh, foreigners, like uh, um, Admiral, um, uh, Admiralty was led by, by French, originally the French uh, officer, um, Bellingshausen, he's uh, German. Grudenstern, he's German. Roots, I mean the roots. They they say that they feel uh, they feel they are Russian. They are Russian by native, by language, by religion, Orthodox. And but anyway, we understand that uh, their roots are from from overseas. Vitus uh, Bering uh, discovered the, the stream between the Alaska <clears throat> as well. He's, he's Danish, a lot of Dutch captain. Um, uh, all the expedition earlier, uh, prior to the Vostok and Mirny expedition, uh, was used there. The German science uh, scientists uh, invited from the uh, yeah from the German universities. Yeah, that's true. That's only first probably would be uh, the Vostok and Mirny being led by the Russian science. Scientist, seem enough. So while it was rather swept under the carpet initially, what is the legacy of the expedition today? I would count it as a first real scientific and with a full, with a new form, a uh, new idea of the expedition made by Russians. It was um, uh, paid by the uh, Royal Society. Was, uh, wasn't uh, engaged by the trade companies as a previous one, like Kuzenstern and previous, uh, who are uh, led to, to the organizing the uh, Russian American company. That expedition is absolutely different. The point of uh, new time of discovering the world, a new way of discovering the world to collect, to understand, to study. That was a first sample, as I can record and, uh, and find it in, in the world. There wasn't any commercial uh, ideas, uh, any commercial purpose of this expedition. It only was investment to discover, to study, to learn, to collect, to understand. That expedition, it's a some first sample of what, the, what we uh, understand now as a as a, a scientific discovery expedition, as it is, where the science is the first. It's nothing to do with a uh, commercial purpose. And, and, and as well, let's uh, look, the name of, of the boats, Peaceful, East, uh, the another two was um, Wellness and uh, Discovery. Peaceful, Wellness, uh, Discovery in the East, uh, uh, the expedition which uh, we started in uh, uh, 2018 to celebrate 200 years of the discovery Antarctica in 2020 uh, we named this expedition Peaceful East we just changed the position of two uh, names of the schloops which Vostok was a flagship and Mirny was uh, a bit smaller so Peaceful East that's 200. That's our expedition, which we, uh, we started uh, 2019, approach to, the, uh, to celebrate 200 years of the first visit of Russian into Taranui and meet Maori. Which was unfortunately disrupted when the borders closed for COVID. Yeah, but we're not stopped. We, we, we have it postponed, it, but it's still, it's still on plan. It's everything. Yeah, we look, for, we look forward to, to, um, uh, to announce a new date for, uh, for visits uh, to about Nadezhda, New Zealand, um, end of uh, 2023. The main reason is uh, to bring the, the ability to learn and study this unique artifact collection which stored in the Kronstadt and Kazan University since 1820. There are big plans um, to foundate the scientific group 
university, a PhD student, master degree student from Russia in New Zealand to have access uh, to the archives in uh, Kronstadt, uh, sorry, in um, Kunstkamera and to do the uh, digital scanning uh, and 3D scanning of uh, those artifacts to be able to study it, to learn it, to, to make it sound, uh, talk about this expedition, talk about the first visits uh, Russian in New Zealand, uh, to give more ability for young generation to study and learn it. Thank you, Sergei, for coming on the show to tell us all about the Bellingshausen expedition. I found it very interesting, and I hope the listeners have enjoyed it as well. Thank you, Jack. It was an uh, honor to be with you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, first time I was um, um, using the uh, other language rather than Russian to talk about this expedition. Oh, really? It's great that uh, English speaker audience uh, will appreciate it. And um, I'll, it's a part of my life. It takes more than 10 years of learning and studying that. And I want to bring it for wider knowledge for New Zealand and even for Russian. Still, I'm at New Zealand. Uh, uh, here and they never heard about Russian being in New Zealand uh, 20 years before the treaty of Waitangi was signed, before the uh, New Zealand state was nominated. Thank you very much, Jack. That was Sergei Permitin on the Bellingshausen expedition. I hope my New Zealand listeners will mark their calendars for December 2023 and the visit of the commemorative expedition. And in the meantime, if you are passing through Picton, you can see an exhibit on the Russian stay in Tataranui at the museum there. In the show notes, you can find a link to the Russian Museum's collection of paintings from the expedition by Pavel Mikhailov and to two articles in New Zealand Geographic with a detailed look at the first Russian visit to New Zealand. The 1994 article, From Russia with Respect, that triggered Sergei's interest, and a 2020 article with more recent information. We return to our main narrative with our next episode, Step Warriors Part 2, Wolf Packs and Warbands. Until then, thank you for the new reviews. If you're enjoying the show and can spare a minute, please think about leaving your review too. It helps make the show more visible to new listeners. Thank you for listening and see you next time.